originally, uh, the channel started off me just BMX riding. People can go on the channel and see a few BMX clips of me riding the bike. We used to have to make BMX videos to get into competitions. Uh, you send it to the competition, they'll say, yep, you're good to ride, or no, you're not good enough, or uh, also you're making these videos for sponsors as well. So you put videos out, if they do really well, you're likely to get sponsorships, which would then help you to get to these competitions and do all these shows and things like that as well. As I was mentioning, it, it started changing a lot, the BMX world, and instead of just uploading clips of you riding, it became, more showing your personality as well. So we started leaving in bits of like funny parts of when we was riding and then so a, bit, a bit more talking. And then also I got s talking about my cars. I was always into cars and modifying them and everything like that. And I, I think one video I walked around my car, I think it was a, an E-Class at the time, a Mercedes E-Class. And that video was did better than a lot of the BMX videos. I was like, what? that's strange. Like I've walked around the car, put no effort in, and uh, the video's done really well, but obviously the audience for automotive is huge. And anyway, I thought, okay, people are interested in the cars. A lot of people are asking what's going on with the car, this, that, and the other. Then one day, my girlfriend crashed her Audi TT she had. And to buy it back from the insurance, it was 600 pounds. And it was like a 4,000, 5,000 pound car. I thought, well, it looks like quite an easy repair. So I thought, if only I've only got to lose 600 pound, if worst case. so. I bought the car back from insurance and thought I'd decide to fix it and film it at the same time. So I really started filming stuff as well to help me know how to put things back together as well because you can always look back on the content of what you took off and where it went. And one thing led to another. I started filming one video and that got about three or 4,000 views. People then were asking, when's the next video? We want to see what you're going to do to it. So then I filmed another one and then the following grew a bit more and everyone kept asking about the TT and there's a real niche for this TT. I think I ended up making like 30 videos on this TT of rebuilding it, then modifying it and doing everything you could do to a TT. I could not believe how many people were interested in it. At the time, it's still just sort of like a hobby on the side of BMX and everything like that. Then COVID happened. I got furloughed from my job. I was at home for five weeks. I didn't know how long I was going to be home for originally. And at the time I'd saved up to buy a, a house. I saved up to buy another house. And that was sort of my way out of the matrix as such. It was, it was the only way out. I was working nine till five. I was working in the evenings in an Indian restaurant as well. And I was just saving up as much money as I could to buy houses, rent them out, and that was gonna be my passive income, so then I could, wouldn't have to work as much so I could ride my bike and do stuff with cars. Obviously, COVID happened, I wasn't sure about the housing market, I didn't know whether I should buy during lockdown or not, and it was a bit of a risk, but also at the time, I think, I was probably making a couple hundred pounds a month from YouTube, and I was really enjoying it, so I thought, well, why not? It would give me something to do, Let's buy a big project to do on the driveway at my house and we'll film it. I've got plenty of time. I bought a Bentley Continental GT, £10,000, and decided to rebuild it on my driveway. It was had a front end knock and from then on, the channel just absolutely blew. I think everyone was at home watching the videos and really enjoying the rebuild because a lot of people were doing stuff to their cars. It was the only thing you could do at the time and was really enjoying rebuilding it. The papers got involved and then local radio station was ringing me up and we did stuff on the local radio. And then I kind of realized, okay, this is what working should be about. It's like, I'm actually enjoying it. It's not going to work every day and this, that, and, and coming home and just having the small amount of spare time. I was doing what I loved doing. Five weeks later, my boss called me back into work. I didn't want to go back in, but at the time everyone's, getting laid off jobs because of COVID. So I thought it was the worst time for me to quit my job, but I was in there for about a week and I could not concentrate. I was getting brand deals offering me money to do videos. And I think at the time I was earning more from one video as I was doing in the whole month of working at my job. And I was working there five days a week and I could just film one video and earn the same in one video. And it was a no brainer for if, if I just go for it, and I'll try it for one year. If it doesn't work out, I can go back and get a normal job again. And I left my job, it was the best thing I did. The more I put into the YouTube channel, the more I got out of it, putting 100% in every, every day, I had more time. 
I was enjoying it more and more and more. And then when it got into winter time and I was still doing it on my driveway, then I had to gamble and take on a unit so I could work inside the workshop there so I could cons consistently put out videos rather than if it's raining outside, I couldn't film. And from the units and opened up more doors, could do bigger projects and well, to now 1.4 million subscribers later and the crazy car collection, it's completely changed my life. Like now we have my girlfriend's working for me, my dad's here in Florida, I've got a filmer here with me and it's in a matter of three or four years. Like it's not even been tens of years yet, it's three or four years and it's completely changed everything. It's a crazy story to think about, but yeah, so grateful for it. We did go from the TT, after that I bought an Audi S5, but it wasn't damaged. It was just the cheapest S5 I could find in the country. It was 5,000 pounds and it needed a lot of work doing to it. And it was less of a risk because I could drive it. And like I, I thought because it's cheap, I can't lose any money on it. It can't get any cheaper than what it was. So it was less of a risk. And it, even now to this day, I feel like the bigger the risk is, the more people enjoy it because they can see like, I'm worried about this. and when you're at the peak of emotion and this, that, and the other, the, the videos do better. So going from, I think from the S5 after that, and then moving to the Bentley, I think people loved it. It brought in a completely different audience. We had like a lot of older people watching as well. And then everyone knows the brand Bentley. So it just brought in a huge audience. And even I forgot to mention it, they, when we finished the build, Bentley themselves contacted us and said they love watching the videos. And we were so surprised because we're just a guy in the driveway with a backwards hat on, like fixing this car and we had no, no, no idea about. And they invited us to the headquarters in Crewe and we brought the car up and they checked it over at their place. And whilst they were checking it over, they gave me a brand new Bentley to drive around for a few days whilst it was up there. And they really loved the videos and all the mechanics were kind of praising me really. It was like, oh yeah, you were like us back in the day working on the driveway. and. From then on, we managed to get a small opening in lockdown where you were allowed out and we drove the Bentley to Monaco. And as you may know, going to Monaco, the outside the Monte Carlo Casino, they will only park cars there, which are kind of supercars or luxury cars. So we was, our goal was to drive all the way to Monaco. And if the 10,000 pound Bentley gets parked outside the casino, we've made it. And we got all the way down there. We got up to the valet driver, handed him the key and he parked it outside the front of the Monte Carlo Casino and everyone was taking photos with it and was like, well, it's 10,000 pounds and it's next to million pound Bugatti Veyrons and things like that. So it's, it was such a good story. And after we've done all of that and got home, we then actually raffled off the car. It was, I think 15 pounds a ticket for people bought a ticket for. And the guy who won the car, was a young lad like 21 years old and I'm thinking oh he's not gonna be able to insure it or tax it or anything like that and we drove it down to him to give him the car this is the one car I regret getting rid of because I love the car but we gave this car to Jack who lived down south in England he would when we got there he'd already taxed it he'd already insured it and he daily drives the car so it was what a story that car has got but if I had, ever had to have one car back it would be that Bentley 100% it's just a good all round car, daily in it, can have fun in it. it Hannah liked it, my girlfriend, it likes, she rarely likes the cars to drive. <laughs> They're either too loud, too uncomfortable, or she doesn't like the clunky gear stick or something like that, but the Bentley was perfect, so. <laughs> I bought a Lamborghini Gallardo after wanting to own a Lamborghini for so long with intentions to twin turbo it. So I bought the cleanest Gallardo I could buy, low mileage and twin turbo the car. It drove great, it did 2000 miles in it. Twin turbo, it never skipped a beat, it was amazing. It was such a fast car and is exactly what I wanted. But for some reason we thought it'd be a good idea for the YouTube channel to do a road trip to Barcelona and originally was going to get the ferry from Portsmouth, a 24 hour ferry which takes you past France into Bilbao in the top of Spain and then it's about a seven or eight hour drive I think to Barcelona 
and well, me, it was me and Hannah, just ourselves. And we got on the 24 hour ferry, we got there fine, car's been running great. And as soon as we got off the ferry, the car started doing some strange things. So we was driving along, I think about 10 minutes down the journey and the car just started dropping revs and just completely cutting out for no reason. Then the rev counter was going up, down, up, down, for no reason, the car would cut out. We pulled over and we thought maybe it's bad fuel. So we pulled over into the petrol station and we filled up the car with some fresh petrol. Driving for, oh, it's working good again, was driving. At one point, we got to a toll booth and you pull up to the toll booth, you get your ticket out. And when you pull out of the toll booth, there is like a free for all. Every, it's like six lanes, everyone's flying at the same time. We just pulled out for the toll booth and the car cut out completely. And we're sitting duck in the middle of this free for all in a Lamborghini where everyone's like, ha ha, yeah, look, and like trying to take photos of you and like laughing at you. And like, you're in a Lamborghini broken down. It's, it's funny to a lot of people. At the time, Hannah, my girlfriend was almost in tears. Like, oh, what are we gonna do? We can't get out of the car because we're in this free for all of craziness. So, the only thing I could do was try and start it in gear and it would jump the car and was doing that until we could just get to the side of the road. We got to the side of the road and I had no idea what was going on with this car. And the car was also on Cyvex ECU, so standalone ECU because of the turbo. So I couldn't just plug in a diagnostic tool, read the fault codes in and tell me what's wrong. It needs like an ethernet cable, it needs a laptop. I had a Mac and no ethernet cable, side of the road in Spain and speak English, not Spanish. <laughs> We then had a recovery driver pull up to the side of us, which spoke very broken English and said, what's the problem? We said, well, the car just would run for a bit and then just shut off. And we had no idea. And we've contacted a lot of people. And then they said to us, well, we're going to give you 15 minutes. And if after those 15 minutes, we're going to tow you off, off the road. So we then had the idea that it might be a tracker on the car. There might be when we've got to Spain, it might be shutting off the car because it's in a different country and it's stolen. And there was a tracker on the car. So we called the tracking company and we said, is there anything that could immobilize this car if it was taken abroad because you think it's stolen? And they said, we cannot immobilize the car. We can notify you that it's gone abroad, but we cannot immobilize it. And we weren't sure how much we believed of that because a lot of people were telling us it was the immobilizer, which made complete sense because we got off this ferry and the car was instantly broken from that point. We had no choice but to get it on the back of this recovery truck. And the recovery truck takes us to this random garage in the middle of the mountains in Spain. No one speaks English at all. Dropped us off there. We had to pay him about 100 euros to drop us off there. And we're in this garage, huge, huge garage as well. No one's speaking English there as well. We're trying to start the car and when we're starting it, it's really loud and it's echoing through the whole of the garage and the workers are coming over and saying, shut the car off, it's too loud in here. So we didn't know what to do. We'd already booked a hotel for this whole trip in Barcelona and we had the choice of leave the Lamborghini in this garage. We've never been before in the middle of the mountains in Spain and carry on with the trip or stay here for the whole time trying to solve an issue that we might never get to solve. And we chose to leave the car there. When we left the car there, the guy asked for the keys and was a bit worried about that. We gave the guy the keys and we hired a Fiat Panda and did the rest of the road trip in a Fiat Panda, but we couldn't really enjoy it because we were thinking constantly, what is wrong with this Lamborghini and how are we gonna get it back on the ferry to get home? I came up with the idea that it could be a fuel relay. The fuel relay could be overheating and flicking off the fuel or something like that, something to do with the fuel. I went into the Volkswagen dealership when we got to Barcelona, picked up a fuel relay for the Gallardo. Obviously, Audi, Volkswagen Audi owned it. It was all the, all the same sort of stuff from there. So we picked up this relay and we drove all the way back to, it was half an hour from the ferry port, this garage. When we got back, the car was still there and neither of those guys had any ethernet cables or laptops I could plug in to diagnose the car. We plugged in this fuel relay and the car started up first time and ran smooth as anything. And we were celebrating, we was like, we've done it, we're, we're there. We've, all we've got to do is drive half an hour back to the ferry docks. Hannah was in the Fiat Panda, I was in the Lamborghini. It was like, 
we've made it, job done, it's all over with. We started driving down the road, I think we got about 10 minutes, car shuts off again, and we're back to square one, and we're in this petrol station, trying to work out what we can do with it. We've called Ricky from RE Performance, who's put the turbos on the car to ask him. He couldn't work anything out without this ethernet cable, which we'd searched around for, and I mean, even if we had that, it, we could probably find out what's wrong with it, but not fix it. We didn't have the tools or anything like that. And we were at this petrol station. We didn't know what to do. We found that the car would run run for longer when it was cold. So we left it there. We had food and then we started up again. We thought, well, it was cold last time and it ran for 10 minutes. So we'll just keep doing 10 minute stints until we get to the ferry. And the ferry was leaving the following morning and we're 20 minutes away from the docks. We started it up. Ran again, perfectly fine. Hannah's following me. Then we start to get into the busy, more bigger highways in Bilbao and the car starts juddering again. It's going, it's going, it's going. And we pulled over on the side of the highway, such a busy highway. Hannah's behind me in the Fiat Panda. I said to her, look, we're, this is it. We're in the middle of this highway. We can't stay here for long to let it cool down because we're on this busy road. So we didn't know what to do. Next thing, the police pull in front of us in this riot van almost and there's six officers get out and they say what's what's the problem I said well the cars it won't run it it doesn't it doesn't go and they said well have you got anyone to come and pick up and tow you away and in Spain we didn't realize it's illegal to tow a vehicle with another vehicle you it has to be on a pickup truck to take it anywhere they said we've got to get another pickup truck to pick up the car but they also said because they are not traffic officers, we're gonna to have to inform the traffic officers. And this is a stupid part by me. They said, have you got your logbook and insurance details? In the UK, you don't have to bring your logbook around with you anywhere. You don't have to bring your insurance. Everything's online, you can show them. I said, no. And they said, well, if you don't show them your logbook, your proof of ownership and insurance, they're gonna impound the car. So we're in with another problem already. So we had, until these traffic officers turned up to get our logbook insurance details, we're calling home, we're having to get people to run around in the unit at home to find our house keys, to go back to our house, to open up there and find the logbook and insurance to take photos of it. They eventually got it just in time and the guy arranged for us to have a pickup truck come and pick the Lamborghini up. The story continues. <laughs> we're on this pickup truck, he drops us to the docks. And the doxes say um, this side and then the car park to wait for the docks is this side. It's 100 meters away, say. So it was like, well, the next morning, all we've got to do, the Lamborghini's just got to start up and drive 100 meters onto the ferry and jobs are good. And we're on the ferry, we can deal with it when we get home. As we were sat in this car park and it was getting late at night and the Lamborghini's there and we was gonna go and get a hotel, we started seeing a lot of dodgy things go on in this car park where there's people trying to jump on trucks and there's people trying to jump to like get into the UK because they're getting on the ferries and there's a lot of kind of like people around there just looking for, there's a lot of security going on. There's, there's some dodgy stuff going on. Was like, I do not feel comfortable leaving the Lamborghini here in the car park at night. So we came to the agreement, me and Hannah did, that we would park the Fiat Panda next to the Lamborghini and sleep in the Fiat Panda next to, next to the Lamborghini overnight because we did not feel comfortable leaving it there. So we slept in a Fiat Panda next to the Lamborghini at night all the way through to the following morning. And the following morning came, it's nine o'clock, the ferry's at 10 o'clock and I get into the Lamborghini to start it and it starts first time every time and was like, it's good, we're gonna make it home today. Hannah dropped the Fiat Panda back to the rental car company. Hannah's got back into the Gardo after she's dropped the car. I've drove up the hill and as I've got to the very top of the hill, the car's cut out again and was like, okay, it's cut out, it's fine. We're in the queue for the ferry, we can do this we'll get on and I'm trying to restart it. It wouldn't restart. Eventually the battery dies. It's completely flat and we can see the ferry from where we are and we're 
in the queue there. Hannah's going mental at me, like saying, we should never have bought this Lamborghini here. We could not go. Everyone again is driving past us, filming us because we're in a Lamborghini broken down. It's hilarious. So <laughs> then we were saying to the, we explained to the ferry company, okay, the cars keeps breaking down. All we need to do is push it onto the ferry. They said it's against their health and safety policy to push the car onto the ferry. The car has to drive onto the ferry. We're having a nightmare. No one stopped to help us. Only one guy stopped with who had a van with motorbikes in the back. So he had some jumper leads in it. We're trying to jump the car. It still wouldn't start. So he said, I'll tow you onto the ferry. And as we've mentioned before, you cannot tow a car in Spain. So our plan was to ask the passport control. We're going to go through passport control. When we've gone past there, are we on British soil? And can we tow the car onto the ferry? They said, that's correct. Yeah, you can tow the car when you're on British soil, but you can't tow the car onto the ferry because it's against their health and safety policies. So the car can't be towed on, it has to drive. So the only way for us to get on this ferry was with a pickup truck again. So we had to call the same company that picked us up on the side of the road to come and pick up the Lamborghini and take it on the ferry. We had, we're talking like five to eight minutes to get on the ferry to go home and the guy just made it in time got the lamborghini onto the ferry and rolled it off and we was on the ferry it was the best ferry ride we've ever had because it's such a relief before finally getting back into the uk and getting a pickup truck it from the uk back to re performance where we checked the car over and the one thing it turned out to be after all of that was a crank sensor, which was 30 pounds, 30 pounds crank sensor, but it required a lot of dismantling to get to the crank sensor anyway. We wouldn't have been able to do it even if we found that out. But uh, what was happening is because the crank sensor had no idea what the flywheel was doing, it wasn't registering where it was revving, it didn't know when to spark, when to, when to ignite, it had no idea. And apparently quite common on these Lamborghinis as well, it's just, nothing to do with the turbo kit, nothing to do with the modifications. It just decided to fail at that time. And it was just my luck. It happened as we got into Spain. Since we changed the crank sensor, cars ran amazingly. It was just a bad luck, which made for a lot of good videos, I guess, but, and a good story. <laughs> As far as we know, it's completely legal, but <laughs> we, we don't know to this day. I never was a Porsche guy at all. And I kind of agreed with my girlfriend that they all look the same. I didn't really understand the model names and numbers. Never really got them. Everyone says you have got to drive them to really get them. And a Cayman S came up on Copart and it, the actual repair work that I wanted to do on a car was quarter panels and roof. I wanted to learn how to do it. And that had all the damage that I wanted to learn how to do. It had rear quarter panel damage. It had door damage. Had wait, There was not one good panel on it. Apart from, I think the bonnet was okay or the hood in America, but the car had been completely rolled over and not one thing was good on it. I bought that car, nobody else bidded on it on Copart, so straight the way you're worried. And when it got dropped off, yeah, the car was an absolute state. Every single panel was bad. Everyone who looked at the car just thought I was mental. We ordered the parts from Porsche and drilled off all the rear quarter panels, the A-pillars, the roof. The car was a complete shell of a car and rebuilt everything from scratch, really. Every single panel has pretty much been replaced and the engine was good. and. As I mentioned, it wasn't really a Porsche car, but when I got that on the road, I could not believe how well a Cayman S drove. Like, it's only a two and a half litre four cylinder engine, but it was fast and it handled so well. And I, I've said to my filmer, Matt, I was like, I'm thinking of selling the Aston because I like this Cayman so much. Since having the Cayman and driving that every day and people seeing that and the Porsche content was doing really well on my channel as well, then Adam LZ's 992 GT3, which got crashed on Tail of the Dragon, then got put on Copart in the US. 
Again, I thought it's not a possibility I'm ever gonna buy that. It's 4,000 miles away from my house. In no man's land, really, like buy cars in the UK. I don't, I've not got anywhere to rebuild it. There's no chance of me buying it. But everyone kept sending me it, and like, I loved the car, and I knew how hard it was to get one as well. I mean, it was it's all invitation only in the UK to buy one. They're selling for over the actual list price of the car as well. Anyway, a, a month before this car appeared on Copart, Adam Elsie's GT3, I'd met Freddie Tavarish, and he came over to the UK, met him at a car show, and he mentioned to me, if I ever want to rebuild a car in the US, give him a message and he'll happily host me at his place. And that just stuck in my mind. And when this GT3 popped up, I gave him a message and said, were you serious about that offer of uh, coming down to rebuild a car over there? He goes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, come over, rebuild it. You can have a little space in the unit, go for it. So he helped me out with bidding on the car. I won the car. And the only time I've ever seen that Porsche is on Adam's channel and the damage, we only knew what the damage was gonna be from Adam's channel. So before we went, we were zooming in on the damage, trying to find, oh, it looks just like a bumper, a wing, a headlight, a, perhaps a bonnet and some suspension damage. So it'd be a nice, easy rebuild and it will break me into doing stuff over in America. We flew over to America and then one problem led to another problem, led to another problem. We, we got here, started stripping apart the car. We found it had structural damage to the front tub. Then starting the car was an issue as well. We found out like pyro fuses for the car, which break when the airbags go off. That was hidden way underneath the dash. So a lot of complicated stuff was going on with, with the car. And we only in America for limited time each time. Freddie then mentioned to us, oh, we need structural parts. And the US will not sell you structural parts because of their law over here where Porsche registered repairers have to pay millions of pounds, I'm sure they were saying, for a license to be a Porsche registered repairer. So if you go into a dealership and ask for a front tub, which is what we need, they won't sell it to the public at all. But the UK will sell it to the public, but they won't tell you how to fit it. The US Porsche would sell us airbags, which made no sense because they can sell us explosives but they can't sell you structural parts. So they were happy selling us airbags because we obviously couldn't take airbags on the plane, but it's a weird law, but it's all to do with money, I think, because the body shops pay so much to be certified repairers. So I think that's why, if they sold me a structural part, these body shops would be going to them and saying, how come you're selling this YouTuber who has no idea about doing body work on a car, structural parts, and you're not sending them to us to, repair it. So I think that's the whole reason behind it. The only option was to fly back, contact UK Porsche and ask them, okay, we need this front tub for a 992. This is what we need. And we'll buy as many parts as we can there. We put them in our suitcase and we'll fly back to America with the structural parts in there. You'll see videos of us with huge boxes going back. And I mean, as far as we know, it's completely legal, but <laughs> we, we don't know to this day, but we got, it, we got it over and we started all the structural repair on the car. And luckily Jack at Freddie's workshop has done a lot of structural repairs to cars before. He's been in a body shop there and have carried the experience from doing the Cayman S as well. So that really helped. Since then, we've rebuilt all the structural parts of the car. We've done all the suspension damage to the car and had it painted, but at the same time, going to and from the UK for parts. But the best thing as well is Champion Porsche in Miami have actually helped us as much as they possibly can without selling us the structural parts. So they have been a, a real help as much as a lot of people think the main dealer are against us. They, they're not against us, they just try to follow rules. So it's trying to please both people at the same time, but they are shocked that the UK people can sell as structural parts. But it is what it is. And now we have a GT3, which by the time this video probably goes out, is actually on the road. So <laughs> it's made a really good story. Our whole plan at the end is, of course, the car got crashed on Tale of the Dragon. The whole idea was to rebuild the car and take it back to Tale of the Dragon and actually see it. And again, it's the only, I've only seen Tale of the Dragon on videos. So actually seeing it in real life is gonna be another kind of huge reality check and be amazing to drive as well, but also a perfect end to the story to take it back to where the car was crashed. And we just wanna see the corner, sort of see exactly what happened. It would have been amazing 
to get Adam involved, but I think Adam is really shook up about the whole crash. I mean, understandably, all the airbags went off, had his girlfriend in the car as well, and then a, a white truck just comes completely on the wrong side of the road and wipes out pretty much his dream car at the time. So I, I can understand why he probably doesn't want to see the car, but it would have been amazing to get him on the channel. But I think, yeah, it's it's not a good idea for him, but to go back to the place is going to be an amazing end for the story. And hopefully it stays in one piece and we <laughs> can take it back afterwards. <laughs> And they mentioned that their mechanic who previously put this car back together or tried to put it back together was now in prison for armed robbery. Most people would have known uh, that my dream car is a Marshall Argo since like the dawn of day anyway, like yourself. I had a phone call one day from a Trek Experience company and they said, look, we've got a Mercer Largo here, which is in a bit of a state. It was an ex Trek Experience car and like we're looking to sell it. Would you be interested? And I was like, oh, obviously, of course, I'm interested in a Mercer Largo, especially one that I've got the chance to like rebuild because it'll work well with the channel as well. So. Uh, invited us down yeah and then he when we got down there he mentioned that he actually had two not one so we walked around the place and it was full x track well it is a track experience place but there's cars there which have been beaten the hell out of and then just left to sit there they've taken parts off the cars and um they've just sat there for days on end and uh, this Mercer Largo was sat there for seven years uh, where it had an issue apparently with uh, just a rattly chain, but they've taken a mechanic who worked there previously, has taken the engine out, attempted to fix the rattly chain, and just tried to put it back together. And when they put it back together, the engine just went tight. And because he spent so much time on it, and they're all about a quick turnover, they want to get the cars back on the track, they decided not to carry on with the build because it was just, they'd have to take the engine apart all over again. So I went to see it, I've seen this green one, that's the one with the engine out, and then they showed me a yellow one, which was in a bit better condition, but they wanted more money for it. Uh, at the time, I thought it was a brilliant idea to go for the green one, which needed more work, and that's what I did. But he wanted £100,000 for uh, this green one, and I was um and ah -ing about it for a while, and... Obviously, with it being a dream car and not getting another chance for it, I tried to knock him down, but he just wouldn't come down on the price. And then we came on an agreement that I'd pay £100,000 if the car was complete. So the deal was, I'm paying for the car, but everything is there. So even though the engine has been taken out and all the bolts are everywhere and this, that and the other, as long as everything was there, I'm completely fine with it. And if it wasn't there then they were gonna pay for it. So uh, we noticed that there was no clutch when we picked up the car and there was no flywheel. They said they'll pay for that. Maybe I was too naive at the start, but <laughs> we paid for that. Uh, they said they'll pay for that. There was throttle bodies missing, which we later found out they're uh, secondhand, at least 1,100 pound each a throttle body. So yeah, we we were missing them. But I took it home anyway. I bought the my dream car and it was amazing for a good, day and then the realization of having to rebuild it kicks in when we start rebuilding it and we just found endless amount of things wrong with it the the cam caps on top of the engine even though they're numbered from factory 1 to 24 even on each single with the cam they were all muddled up so the guy who rebuilt the engine obviously probably couldn't count but <laughs> it was just the simple things and we've never rebuilt a Lamborghini engine before and but the mistakes that were made rebuilding that were ones that were just made on it could be made on any car you don't have to be a lamborghini mechanic to know why the cam caps go in order of one to all the way to 24. as we stripped it apart we found the timing was out there was broken piston rings the conrod caps again which were all numbered they were all muddled up uh, there was loads of shortcuts taken and we called the track experience company and we said right what's the whole story with this why is it got to this state and they mentioned that their mechanic who 
previously put this car back together, or tried to put it back together, was now in prison for armed robbery. They left the company, I think he got maybe sacked or he left the company, and then later, yeah, committed a crime and he's in there for armed robbery, which explains a lot, I guess. Anyway, after rebuilding it, we filmed the whole thing on my channel and the track experience company went completely cold on us about everything. We called them asking for like a clutch or a flywheel. We never really got anything back. We just thought, well, that's it. I've handed the money over. There's no chance of me being able to get anything from them. Uh, we actually heard from them saying that they found some more parts for it one day and we went down to their shop and they'd found like a strut bar, a, a strut brace which went across the back and they mentioned that some of my followers were messaging the company saying that they're making a petition to get some of my money back because they knew the whole agreement. We had nothing to do with it or anything like that. And yeah, apparently my followers were going after them saying like, we're going to try and get Matt Armstrong some money back. And so they said, can you call them off? So well, <laughs> we said, well, if you help us out, which will look good for you, then we'll help you out by, it will look good for you. If they're helping us out, people will then see the track experience company in a good light. But again, nothing really ever happened of it. And we carried on rebuilding the car and we got finally to almost the last stages of rebuilding it just the other week. And we had to call for help from a guy called Sonny at BHP in London. He's a Mercer Largo specialist. And I called him and then he goes, oh, I know the history of this car. The chap at that track experience place, he put that together. Completely a different mechanic to what they were telling us, but this guy who's supposedly in prison, he was saying another mechanic put it together and yeah, it just didn't run at all. And when the car's been dropped off to Sonny for him to work on, apparently a previous bill wasn't paid, so he refused to work on it. And yeah, he said it, the whole car is a mess and you don't know how many miles has actually been on it. We still don't know to the day how many miles are on it because the instrument cluster, that was completely gone because they'd jumped the car the wrong way around with um, the battery terminal. So we had to get a new instrument cluster as well. And with a new instrument cluster, just reset the mileage back to zero. So we still have no idea how many miles the cars are actually gone. The last mileage check we did on the car, on the it said 75,000 miles. So that's the last MOT when it was on the road. And that was 2011 maybe. So it's probably done 75,000 miles in 2011. We don't know from then how long it's it was on the track for or anything like that. And we'll, we won't know unless we got the original clocks working and the original clocks are fried. We've tried so many people to try and to get them to work and no one, everyone says, well, even if you do get them to work, the whole memory would have just lost in the clocks because everything's been short circuited inside. So we don't, no, at, like it could have done way over a hundred thousand miles or it might have been 75,000 miles and then stopped. We honestly don't know, but it doesn't look too bad. It just looks like it's sat there for a while. But again, as you said, the most loggers like to be driven. So it's probably done it a fairly good job. It has been driven around the track a lot, but we found loads of different things. I mean, the, the fan on the back was wired, so it was constantly on to keep it cool around the track. So there was just some speaker wire holding straight to the positive cable on the battery and then just grounding it out so the, the fan is constantly on. So it's obviously had a hard life. The car was wrapped. We peeled the wrap off the car to find that the whole car had been wet sanded and the passenger side door was just full primered. And we later found some videos online of the Mercer Largo on a track day with a huge dent in the side of the door. Uh, a lot of people messaging his stories saying that, oh yeah, it got put into a tree or someone's drove into it. There's so many different stories of it. And apparently the car got wrapped as part of a show in England for some company who wanted to promote their wrapping. So yeah, so they must have known that the car was like that underneath. Another thing we found, which was quite funny, it did come with a gearbox. Obviously it's been a manual car, that, right, why I wanted it. Before we put the gearbox back in the car, we decided to strip the gearbox apart just to check everything worked. And then later found there was a few extra holes in the gearbox, which we had nothing to put into. Uh, we found that the gearbox is actually from an e-gear car. So we think the car is a manual on 
it, like on when you check the VIN out and everything like that, but we think the gearbox may have blown at some point and then instead of getting a manual box, they put an e-gear box onto it and converted it to manual. And these holes in the gearbox were for sensors, which are for the e-gear. So they've just plugged them up. Also with that, because they have converted it from e-gear to manual, when you put the gearbox into a Mercia Largo and the engine in, it all has to go in in one go. They've all put it in and then to adjust the gear stick to get it sitting right in the center of the gated manual part, there's a adjuster for the gear linkage a little bit further down the gearbox. We found another way of doing this instead of doing this option that they chose to take, but the option they chose to take was cut a hole in the transmission tunnel, which we've seen actually Hoover's garage do on an e-gear, but They've cut this hole out. It, it's not the neatest of holes at all. And uh, yeah, they've adjusted it that way and uh, put it on. But whilst they were drilling the hole, they also must have got a really long drill bit, drilled straight through the transmission tunnel and almost drilled through the gearbox. There is about four marks in the gearbox, which uh, was so close to going through the gearbox. But I guess it all tells a story, the car does. And for that reason, and that reason alone, because we put so much work into it, I'm never gonna sell it. It's <laughs> It's got character, it's got personality. We rebuilt it ourselves. And now we're about to attempt to do a 3000 mile trip on Gumball with it. And if it makes it, it'll, it'd be even more special to me. But if it doesn't, there's no hard feelings. We'll, be, we'll rebuild it again. <laughs> it took us a while to get a, a clutch in the car. We upgraded the clutch and yeah, it took us a while to bleed it, get it in gear. But the first time I've ever driven a Mercer Largo in my entire life was my one. And because the car's not road legal yet, we only got to drive around the car park of the unit. I got it into second gear. And uh, <laughs> that was about it. We realized straight away the brakes, the steel brakes on it do not stop that car. They, it, it, you have to really stand on them with your whole body weight, body weight and it really doesn't stop it. But yeah, that's the first time I ever drove one. And yeah, it was a really good, really good moment. The sound of it's incredible. We put an exhaust on it, obviously. But no, I can't wait to drive it properly. The first time driving it probably will be the gumball. So yeah. <laughs>